Well, tonight we're in the book of Acts, chapter 19. Uh, we're beginning a brand new chapter. Uh, it was actually a section that we started last week, and that's Paul's third missionary journey. Uh, there are three missionary journeys basically recorded in the book of Acts. This will be the last one. Uh, and just a kind of an overview, this one's a little simpler, at least at the beginning, uh, than the other one. Uh, he begins at Antioch, and that's his home church, kind of the sponsoring church. And Paul has begun all of his Gentile missions from the church at Antioch. Uh, you may remember early on in the book of Acts, it was the church at Jerusalem that was the mother church. Uh, but now that the gospel is going out to the Gentile world, in many ways the mother church is now the church of Antioch in Syria. And that's the province there. And he goes back to visit some of those churches he had established on his first missionary journey. Uh, churches in Lystra, Derby, Iconium, and Antioch of Pisidia. And that's in the province of Galatia. And that's in South Galatia. And Paul's going to write the book of Galatians to those churches uh, eventually. In fact, he may write that book uh, when he is in Ephesus. And that's where he's headed. Uh, that's his goal. He wants to now go from Antioch all the way to Ephesus. And basically, that's the primary location of this third missionary journey in the city of Ephesus. He's going to stay there for three years. Uh, Paul has never stayed anywhere for three years as a missionary. He normally gets thrown out in three weeks, uh, but he gets to stay in Ephesus for three whole years uh, ministering to the church there. So that's the primary location of the third missionary journey. And we have that recorded uh, in the book of Acts. Uh, we started that last week looking at Apollos as he was ministering in Ephesus. And Apollos knew about John's baptism, but he didn't know about Christian baptism. So Aquila and Priscilla explain Christian baptism to him. And apparently he gets it. We don't know if he was baptized at that moment or not because the text doesn't say. But eventually Apollos decides to go to Corinth and he has a thriving ministry in Corinth, and then Paul is able to move into Ephesus uh, at that time. So in chapter 19, which we're going to look at tonight, uh, that's his ministry in Ephesus. Uh, chapter 20 is his farewell address to the leaders of the church, and the first part of chapter 21 is a journey to Jerusalem, uh, because Paul is going to want to go back to Jerusalem once again even though he's going to be told not to go to Jerusalem, he decides to go there anyway. So tonight we're going to pick up a story in Acts chapter 19 about Paul's witness to John's disciples. Uh, anytime you go through a book of the Bible, uh, there are some sections that are difficult. Uh, there are some sections that are not easy uh, to understand. Uh, there are some stories when you read them and go, that's a crazy story. And there happens to be a lot of that all in chapter 19. So uh, Luke apparently throws all the crazy stuff into one chapter. And it begins with a very unusual story in verses 1 through 7 about Paul's encounter with some disciples of John the Baptist. And what I want to do is read that story, uh, verses 1 through 7, and then we'll go back verse by verse and talk about it. So... Acts chapter 19, beginning with verse 1, While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked them, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about twelve men in all. So that is a crazy story, huh? Uh, very interesting. Uh, not your normal story. So let's see if we can figure out what's going on. 
It begins in verse 1, while Apollos was at Corinth, he left Ephesus, he went to Corinth. So when Paul arrives, Apollos is no longer there. And Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. If Paul wanted to get to Ephesus in a hurry, he could have gone by boat. It would have been much quicker. But Paul wanted to revisit those churches at Lystra, Derbe, Iconium, and Pisidian Antioch. And because of that, that journey from Antioch to Ephesus over land was about a thousand miles. Uh, Luke doesn't tell us how long that journey took, but in the ancient world, I'm thinking a long time uh, to make a 1,000 mile journey. And he goes through the interior, which means he goes through the Lycus Valley. Uh, in the Lycus Valley are some names of some cities you may recognize, uh, Colossae, Laodicea, and Hierapolis. And eventually there will be churches in those three cities. But Paul did not found any of those three churches. And apparently once Paul left uh, Pisidian Antioch, he made a beeline straight for Ephesus. He didn't even stop in any of those cities uh, to do any ministry. Uh, he was going to Ephesus, and so he headed straight there and skipped those other towns. So when he finally gets to Ephesus, that's his goal uh, to get there, he found some disciples. Verse uh, 7 tells us there are 12 of them. Uh, we find out from the story that these are disciples of John the Baptist. Uh, John the Baptist came on the scene before Jesus, and he was preaching a message of repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. In other words, repent of your sins, get your heart right with God, because the Messiah is coming soon. And that was his message. And of course, we know from reading the Gospels that when he was talking about the Messiah, he was talking about Jesus. But apparently, there are some followers of John the Baptist who are still looking for the Messiah to come. Uh, Jesus had already come, uh, lived 33 and a half years. He had been crucified, rose from the dead, ascended back into heaven, and some of these disciples of John are still looking for the Messiah to come. They had not figured out that the Messiah that John was talking about was Jesus of Nazareth. So they're still looking for a Messiah. There's a question that scholars wrestle with, especially in verse 1 and verse 2. These disciples of John, were they Christians before Paul met them? Or do they become Christians after Paul proclaims the message of Jesus to them? And it's interesting and confusing because here in verse 1, he calls them disciples. And normally, as Christians, when we hear the word disciple, we think disciple of Jesus. Uh, but many say it's really a disciple of John. And then he uses the word believe in verse 2. Have you received the Holy Spirit when you believe? So he's talking about disciples and believers, and so we're thinking Christians. But as we begin to unfold the story, uh, chances are these were very sincere Jewish men, followers of John the Baptist, who heard the message of John the Baptist, but never put two and two together and discovered that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah that John had been talking about all along. So in many ways, they are still looking for a Messiah. And then it goes on to say, Paul asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And that is unusual, that these Jewish men would have never heard of the Holy Spirit. If you read the Old Testament, there are many references to the Spirit of God. Uh, they should have known that God's Spirit is an entity, that He exists. And also, John the Baptist in his preaching basically said, I baptize you with water, but there is one coming after me whose sandals I am not even worthy to tie, 
and He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. That was John's message, that the Messiah would baptize them with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So trying to figure out exactly what these people understood is a little difficult. It could be that, yeah, they know who the Holy Spirit is, and yes, they've heard of the Holy Spirit, but John kept talking about the day when the Holy Spirit would be poured out on people. And that's the part they're not familiar with. Uh, they know John's message, but they don't know Jesus' message. They're unaware that Jesus was crucified, that he rose from the dead, that he ascended into heaven. They're also unaware that Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 happened already. The Holy Spirit has already been poured out on believers in Jesus. And that started in Acts chapter 2. John the Baptist said, The Messiah will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. That happened in Acts chapter 2. That's when that prophecy, that prediction was fulfilled. But apparently these disciples of John are completely unaware of that fact. So all they know is John's message, but they don't know that John's message has been fulfilled in Jesus. And they don't possess the Holy Spirit. Uh, which, if you look in the New Testament, if you have the Spirit of God living in you, you're a believer. But if God's Spirit does not live inside of you, then you're not a believer. Uh, in fact, we call that the witness of the Holy Spirit. That God's Spirit, if He lives inside of us, gives evidence of the fact that He's there and that we belong to Christ. Uh, today we call it the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. When you become a Christian, God's Spirit comes to live inside your spirit. But apparently these disciples of John do not have God's Spirit living inside of them. And that would make them not Christians. Uh, because if, you're, don't, if you don't have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, then you're not a Christian. And that's why many say that they're followers of John the Baptist, but they don't understand Jesus. They know nothing about Pentecost. They don't understand that the Holy Spirit already lives in believers. So Paul will ask them a second question in verse 3. And he'll say, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. And this was true of Apollos as well. Apollos knew John's baptism, but he did not understand Christian baptism. And John's baptism and Christian baptism are not the same. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. Get your life right with God. Get prepared spiritually. The Messiah is coming. That's John's message. Uh, and apparently that's all they know about John's message. Uh, the fact that Messiah is supposed to come, and apparently they're still waiting on Messiah to come. So Paul explains it to them in verse 4. Uh, Paul says John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him. That is in Jesus. So Paul says, I have some news for you disciples of John the Baptist. The Messiah that John was talking about, he's already been here. He's already shown up. His name is Jesus of Nazareth. And so Paul at that point begins to explain to them how everything that John taught pointed to Jesus and Jesus fulfilled everything that John predicted. And because of that, verse 5 says, on hearing this, they were baptized into the name of of Jesus. And this baptism into the name of Jesus uh, signifies the fact that they became believers in Jesus. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. Christian baptism is a baptism of identification. 
Believers in Jesus are identified with Jesus in baptism. Uh, baptism is a picture of a death, a burial, and a resurrection. And Paul will often write about the fact that we are crucified with Christ, we've been buried with Christ, and we rise again to new life in Christ. Uh, meaning our old life before Jesus is dead, it's buried, we have a brand new life in Jesus Christ. That's Christian baptism. The fact that we are identified with Christ. And that was news uh, to these disciples of John the Baptist. They had never heard that before. And they respond uh, by believing in being baptized now into the name of Jesus. Uh, moving on to verse 6, when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues, and they prophesied. Verse 6 talks about Paul placing his hands or laying hands uh, on these believers. So apparently they believed, and then Paul placed his hands on them and prayed over them, and the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they began to speak in tongues, and also they prophesied. Sounds a lot like Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came at that time upon Jewish believers in Jesus. The Holy Spirit came upon them, and Acts chapter 2 says they began to speak in tongues, and Peter stands up and prophesies, proclaiming the message of Jesus to his fellow Jews. So in many ways, we have Acts chapter 2 all over again. Uh, but this time with a different group of people. Uh, this happens to be 12 disciples of John the Baptist who now become Christians who are now going to form the core of the church at Ephesus. So something brand new is about to take place. In Acts chapter 8, Peter and John lay hands on the Samaritan Christians, similar to what Paul did. And when Peter and John place their hands on the Samaritan Christians, they also receive the Holy Spirit. So this laying on of hands is symbolic of the fact that we recognize you and we receive you as a fellow believer in Jesus Christ. So we recognize that God is doing something in you, the same thing in you that he did in us, and we are now connected. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And in Acts chapter 8, it happened to Samaritans, which Jewish people didn't like Samaritans. Uh, they often called them names. Uh, they were half-breeds, uh, part Jewish, part Gentile. But yet, when the Holy Spirit came upon them, Peter and John had to recognize that these Samaritan Christians are now my brothers and sisters in Christ. God is accepting Samaritans into his kingdom. And now Paul does the same thing for these disciples of John at Ephesus. He lays hands on them, and they're now accepted into Christ's church. They're accepted into the body of Christ. They are now complete believers in Jesus. So, once again, uh, God's Holy Spirit is doing something new. And one of the things that Luke wants to point out is that Paul can do what Peter can do. Uh, the first half of the book of Acts is about Peter. And Peter is the leading apostle, the leading disciple of Jesus, in fact, the first part of the book of Acts talks a lot about the disciples, but it's really Peter's story. Uh, Luke follows Peter all along as the leading disciple, the spokesperson for the disciples, and he talks about all that Peter did and how God used him. Now, in the second half of the book of Acts, uh, Luke is saying that God is using Paul in the same way that he used Peter. So what God was doing through Peter, he's now doing through Paul. And we often recognize Peter as the apostle to the Jewish people, and we recognize Paul as the apostle to the Gentile people. 
And so what God did through Peter, he's now doing through Paul. Uh, so it's all connected as God is growing and expanding his church. Verse 7 says, there were about 12 men in all. Twelve disciples of John the Baptist. And we can't help but think about a parallel. The twelve disciples of Jesus. And the church began with the twelve in the upper room, and eventually it grew to 120. But it all began there in Jerusalem with Jesus' disciples. And so God is about to do something brand new in Ephesus, and it's going to start with these 12 guys who are now believers in Jesus Christ. In your notes on page 3, I put a little chart. There are four outpourings of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. And we've now completed all four of them. It begins in Acts chapter 2 as God's Spirit comes upon Jewish believers in Jesus. The church begins in Acts chapter 2. And as the Holy Spirit is poured out, prophecy is fulfilled. We've now begun the new covenant. God's Spirit is being poured out upon believers in Jesus. And Joel chapter 2, which talks about the outpouring of God's Spirit, is now being fulfilled. So the church begins, and the church begins Jewish. Everybody who's a believer in Acts chapter 2 is Jewish. And then the question becomes, who else can receive Jesus? Is Jesus just the Messiah for Jewish people? Or can others join as well? And there were some Jewish people who were thinking, it's just for Jewish people. We're sure of that. But then there's a second outpouring in Acts chapter 8. And we just talked about that. That was the Samaritans. And God's Spirit fell on the Samaritan Christians. And it proves that God is accepting Samaritans who put their faith in Jesus. The church is growing and expanding. Jesus, the Messiah is not just for Jewish people. He's also for Samaritan people who are part Jewish. Then in Acts chapter 10, Peter is proclaiming the message of Jesus in the home of Cornelius. And his family is there too, listening. And as Peter is explaining Jesus, Cornelius and his family believe even before Peter gets to the end of his sermon. And all of a sudden, God's Spirit falls on the Gentiles. And they start speaking in tongues and prophesying. And Peter and his Jewish buddies look around and said, this is Pentecost all over again. God is accepting Gentiles into his family, into his church, in the same way that he accepted us. So now, the church is not just for Jewish people. It's not just for Jewish and Samaritan people. Now it's for Gentile people, too. So Jesus is the Savior, the Messiah, for Jewish people, Samaritan people, and Gentile people. And Paul's buddies looked, and they were just, in, they were just overwhelmed. I mean, they could not believe that God's Spirit would actually come upon a Gentile uh, like it did. And that God is accepting Gentiles into his family. And I'm sure the Jewish people looked at each other and said, maybe we shouldn't call them dogs anymore. Because Jewish people didn't like Gentile people. And they called them names and treated them horribly. And now God was accepting them as they put their faith in Jesus. And the Jewish people had to say, if God's accepting them, we ought to accept them too. God's Spirit is being poured out on them just like it was poured out on us. So we have to accept the fact that 
We now have Gentile brothers and sisters in Jesus. Now we move to Acts chapter 19, where the Holy Spirit is outpoured again. But this time it's on 12 disciples of John the Baptist. And why them and why now? Well, Ephesus is about to become the new center of Christianity. Uh, that whole province called Asia Minor is about to explode in growth in terms of the Christian faith. In fact, I'll show you a verse later in chapter 19 where everybody in Asia Minor is hearing the word of the Lord. So Christianity now has a brand new headquarters. It started in Jerusalem, it went to Antioch, but now it has moved to Ephesus. And God is about to do something incredible in spreading the gospel to the Gentile world. And it's all going to start right there in Ephesus. Eventually, the Apostle John will move to Ephesus. And John will write the book of Revelation. And he'll write it to seven churches. The first church mentioned the church at Ephesus. The other six churches that are mentioned, they're all in Asia Minor. Because by the time John writes, Asia Minor is now the new center of Christianity. And John wrote that book about 90, 95 A.D. And if you think about it, what happened to Jerusalem? It was destroyed by the Romans in A.D. 70. That center of Christianity in Jerusalem is gone. There's a brand new center of Christianity. And to show that, God pours out His Spirit upon these 12 individuals who are now going to help lead that church. So I think that's what Luke is trying to communicate. God's about to do something new and great and spectacular and it's all going to center in Ephesus. And that's why the Holy Spirit is poured out uh, the way He is upon these 12 men who used to be followers of John the Baptist. But now they understood who the Baptist was talking about. It was Jesus. And now they're followers of Jesus. And now they're leaders in the church at Ephesus. Well, let's move on to verses 8 through 12. And that will explain a little bit more about this movement of Christianity that begins in Ephesus. It's Paul's preaching in Ephesus, and it's going to talk about how Paul proclaims the message of Jesus, and then Paul does some extraordinary miracles as well, and we're going to talk about those. It begins in verse 8, where Paul entered the synagogue, and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. When Paul was in Corinth, uh, he got very angry at the Jewish people who opposed him. And he said, from now on, I'm going to the Gentiles. And in Corinth, that's what he did. But now that he's at Ephesus, where's the first place he goes? Back to the synagogue. Uh, Paul always begins his ministry in the synagogue. In the book of Romans, Paul will say that the gospel is to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So that's kind of a strategy for Paul's uh, missionary work. He goes to the Jewish people first and tries to get as many Jewish people as he can to believe that Jesus is the Messiah then everybody else who doesn't believe gets mad at him, throws him out of the synagogue, and then he goes to the Gentiles to proclaim the message from there. And that's what he's going to do in Ephesus as well. Uh, he's going to stay there for three months. You may remember, as Paul finished his second missionary journey, he went from Corinth to Ephesus, and he went to the synagogue for a short period of time. But Paul wanted to go from Ephesus to Jerusalem to get back there for the Passover. So the Jewish people in the synagogue at Ephesus said to Paul, you know, you've got some fascinating things to say. 
Uh, we want to learn more. Why don't you stay here for a while? But Paul says, no, I, I can't do that. Uh, I have to leave, but if it's the Lord's will, I'll come back. Well, apparently it's the Lord's will. Uh, because after a period of time, Paul is back. And he's back in the synagogue. And he gets to stay there for three months. That might be a record for him. He gets thrown out of the synagogue in Thessalonica in three weeks. But in Ephesus, he gets to stay there for three months before they throw him out. Because in verse 9, they throw him out. He says, but some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. In baseball, it's said three strikes and you're out. In literature, three negative comments and you're out. And that's what Paul gives us about the Jewish people who don't believe in Jesus, who were part of the synagogue. First, they become obstinate, stubborn, not about to believe. They were just stubborn in their traditions and in their old beliefs, and they weren't open to anything new, and they weren't open to the fact that Jesus just might be their Messiah. They refused to believe. And I'm sure Paul said to them over and over again, look at these prophecies in our scriptures and notice that Jesus fulfilled them. You know, if Jesus fulfilled all of these prophecies, he has to be the Messiah. Can't you see that? But they refused to believe. And then they publicly maligned the way. They made fun of the way. And one of the early terms for Christianity was the way. So in the book of Acts, that was, you know, we would say Christianity, they would say the way. And it may come from the fact that Christians proclaim that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the way to, the Messiah, to, to God the Father. He is the Messiah, and so he is the way to God. So... They publicly maligned everything that Paul taught. So Paul left them. He did the same thing in Corinth. They threw him out of the synagogue, and he went next door <laughs> to a house that was owned by a fellow Christian, and he began proclaiming the message of Jesus there. So he's going to leave once again. However, he took the disciples with him. So those Jewish people in the synagogue, and some Gentile people as well in the synagogue who believed, Paul takes with him, and he ends up having discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. So apparently there's this lecture hall, and Paul gets access to it. We don't really know much about Tyrannus. Uh, we don't know if he's a Christian, uh, if he's a friend of Paul's, uh, maybe he's a fellow tent maker. Uh, some think that he either owns the lecture hall or he's one of the teachers in the lecture hall. Now, it's interesting that if he's a teacher, tyrannous really means the tyrant. Did anybody ever have a teacher in high school or college, you know, that you kind of nicknamed the tyrant? Yeah, you know how high school students and college students talk about teachers and professors, and you got to stay away from this guy, he's a tyrant. So this is the lecture hall of Tyrannus. Now there is a Western text uh, to this verse that says Paul taught there from the fifth hour until the tenth hour, which would be from 11 o'clock in the morning until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, which was kind of interesting because back in the ancient world, you know, when sun came up, people started to work. And when it got hot, people had a little siesta. You know, it's too hot to work, so they're going to take the afternoon off. And of course, we're talking first century. No air conditioned buildings or things of that nature. So a lot of what they did was outdoors. And from 11 o'clock to 4 o'clock was the heat of the day. In fact, some have said that there were more people sleeping 
in Ephesus at 1 p.m. than at 1 a.m. So it was quite common to stay up late, to get up early, and then take an afternoon nap in Ephesus. So apparently between 11 and 4, the lecture hall was not being used. And so Paul had an opportunity to take it over and to proclaim the message of Christ in this lecture hall. And since it was a public lecture hall, Paul can talk to Jewish people and Gentile people too. Uh, Whoever is not sleeping at 1 o'clock in the afternoon can hear Paul talk about Jesus and Christianity. And so apparently, uh, Paul may have been a tent maker in the morning and a preacher of Jesus in the afternoon. So that may have been what Paul's day looked like, uh, that early in the morning he got up and worked in his tent making business, and then from 11 to 4, he was in the lecture hall proclaiming Jesus uh, to the people who would listen to him. This went on for two years. So for two whole years, Paul was able to freely proclaim the message of Jesus from this lecture hall for five hours a day. And many, many people heard the message of Jesus because of that. So much so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. That's incredible. The growth of Christianity that started in Ephesus. It just covered the entire uh, province of Asia Minor. So Paul is in the lecture hall for two years. Uh, For three months, he's in the Jewish synagogue. Uh, There's a reference in verse 22 to a little bit longer, and that kind of makes up the three years. So apparently it was like nine months doing something else. But Paul's ministry there in Ephesus for three whole years. Now, Paul stayed a year and a half in Corinth, and that was his previous record. But now in Ephesus, he's able to stay unhindered for three whole years, proclaiming the message of Jesus. And a lot of the people who became Christians under Paul's ministry then carried the gospel to other places in Asia Minor. For example, we read of a man named Epaphras. And Epaphras evangelized the Lycus Valley. So he went to Colossae, Laodicea, and Hierapolis. And we read in the book of Colossians that Paul had never been to that church. Uh, Paul spent his time in Ephesus. But some of his colleagues took the message to other cities, and then it grew and expanded like crazy. The seven churches that we read about in the book of Revelation were probably started about this same time. So it was probably through Paul's ministry and the ministry of his colleagues that those seven churches in Revelation got started. Uh, And of course, they were still going strong uh, probably 40 years later uh, when John wrote the book of Revelation. So the province of Asia Minor is intensely evangelized and becomes the new center for the Christian movement. And that's why God poured out His Spirit in such an incredible way upon those twelve. Then in verse 11 and verse 12, we read about some miracles that Paul did. Uh, Even Luke calls them Extraordinary miracles. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. So that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured, and the evil spirits left them. Now this reference to handkerchiefs and aprons, uh, most think these were Uh, items of clothing that Paul used in his tent-making business. And handkerchiefs could really be a sweatband that Paul would put around his head. Uh, Remember, no air conditioning. So he's there working, and it's hot, and, you know, the sweat would just pour off of his head into this band. And then the apron was something he would wear around his waist, the same purpose, 
It was to catch the perspiration. And I'm thinking, if I'm sick, I don't want some smelly piece of cloth you know, showing up to somehow do something great for me. Uh, but for some reason, uh, these people believed that if Paul wore uh, this sweatband or this apron, if they would just take that to a sick person and pray over the sick person, the sick person would become well. And according to Luke, it happened. Uh, their illnesses were cured, and the evil spirits left them. Uh, there's some other interesting uh, miracles like that. M remember the woman who said, if I can just touch the hem of Jesus' garment, then I will be made well. And she did. We also had a reference to Peter's shadow. And if Peter's shadow overshadowed somebody, they would be made well. Uh, so, extraordinary miracles, uh, Luke calls them. Why extraordinary miracles? Two reasons. One is there's a parallel, again, that Luke is writing between Peter and Paul. And it's interesting, if you look at the miracles of Peter and the miracles of Paul, there's a lot of parallels. Uh, they both healed a disabled man. They both cast out demons. They confronted magicians. They raised the dead. And both were dramatically and miraculously released from prison. So what God did through Peter, he's still doing through Paul. And that kind of authenticates Paul's ministry. There's one other reason why God would do these incredible miracles in Ephesus. There was a lot of uh, magic, uh, incantations, spells, uh, worshiping of spirits that took place in Ephesus. So part of the evil uh, that was practiced in Ephesus had to do with the magic arts. And so if somebody got sick, well, you would cast a spell that they would get better. Or you would pray to one of the gods or goddesses and go through all of this uh, rigmarole to try to get the god and goddess to bring healing to the person. Uh, but God was showing that real healing comes through him. And that the message of Christianity is the message of truth. And so God did this to basically speak to these people on their own level, that there's a power greater than magic. It's the power of the living God. And the power of the living God is evident in the message of Christianity that Paul is proclaiming. Remember, it was to the Ephesians that Paul wrote, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers and powers, evil spirits, uh, th those people would have understood that because they wrestled with that as believers too. Because in their culture, there was a lot of worship of evil spirits and principalities and evil angels. And so God is speaking to these people on their level, telling them the message of Christianity is superior to anything that's being practiced in Ephesus. And that was the message that Paul gave the people. And many, many people in Ephesus became Christians. They gave up their spells, their evil spirits, and they turned to faith in Christ.